and um, Christopher Villian, uh, a long-time member of the network, um, is the head of the School of Biomedical Sciences and a full professor in human molecular biology at the University of Free State. Um, he has supervised many uh, masters and doctoral graduates and has served on international committees, including the European Commission Global GMO Network Forum and is also the coordinator of the Southern African Network, <laughs> sorry, um, of GM Detection Laboratories, Sangal, um, which he will share um, with us today. And he's also been uh, a member of the advisory committee for the CBD Secretariat on uh, detection and identification. So a stalwart um, in this area of work. So over to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Wadzi, and thank you firstly to the organizers for the invitation. It really is a privilege to be here, and thank you for the very kind introduction. Wadzi and myself go long back, and uh, we, we know each other's secrets. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Sangal Network, and in specifically the lessons that we've learned from capacity building in Alamo detection in the South African network of GM detection laboratories. So just very briefly for some context, um, in Africa there are about 47 countries that have acceded to the protocol, of which 27 countries have ratified the protocol as of 2023. And there's been a lot of capacity building initiatives, especially in Africa, as other world developing countries. And we know that those activities have not always necessarily paid dividends as much as what we would have hoped. Because there are challenges in terms of the political and the social, uh, socioeconomic environment. So recognizing that networks are really important and networks help, especially regional networks, we look towards establishing the Sangal Network in 2009. We kind of borrowed the name. We, we, instead of calling it the NGL, we called it the Sangal, and it had a nice ring to it. Um, so when we started, we realized we need, within a country, sufficient um, critical mass. So we wanted to identify two countries, two laboratories per country. And we also nominated, that were nominated by the focal points because we wanted those laboratories to have recognition by the regulatory authority. And so currently, the countries that contribute towards Sangal or members of Sangal are 13 countries. I'm listing them there, but I'm going to show you an image so it really is a Southern African network. So these are the countries um, colored in, in light purple that are part of that network. So we've had a number of activities and I'm just going to very briefly um, give some background to that. Um, in 2009, we started the network and we really started by looking at what were the strategic goals and objectives that we wanted to obtain. Um, in 2010, we had um, a train the trainers workshop. Um, 2011, we had a um, workshop to identify the national and regional issues in LMO detection. And I'm going to come back to this point because for the Sangal Network Laboratories, and I have a suspicion that for many other developing countries, the issue is not just about the technical issues on gem detection. Um, and what I will also talk about is a current project which started as a preparatory project, 2013-14, um, a UNEP-JEF funded project that was coordinated by RAIN Africa 
And then from 2017 to 2023, we've had a multi-country project looking at not just alum detection, but really the um, enabling environment in LMO detection. So this is just, it's always nice to see some faces. These are some of the faces from the 2011 um, workshop. So in terms of lessons learned, what we have found is that the environment that the laboratories need to function in, um, there are some constraints. And one of those constraints is simply the lack of the regulatory environment. There's insufficiently trained human capacity, there's a lack of physical resources in laboratories, and there's a lack of access to affordable equipment and consumables. Now, this is, I think, quite common for many other developing countries. So, so this in itself is not new. But the challenge, because of the environmental or the in, in environment in which the training and the Alamo detection is occurring, is that countries don't have a functional regulatory system, which means that they are using interim measures to manage LMOs, but it also means there's no mandate for regulatory laboratories to perform GM detection. And that's a problem, because if there's no mandate, there's no budget, there's no finances, and it's very difficult to convince donors that this is a particular um, priority in the country, because it simply doesn't exist. In terms of the human capacity, um, it's not just a case that there's a lack of trained capacity. So I must really add a disclaimer. Um, you shouldn't think that in Africa there's not capacity. There is capacity, and there's incredibly good capacity. It might not always be in GM detection, but it might be in other things, in virus detection. The problem is that when we start doing capacity building, that develops expertise in a particular field that is sought after. And so those staff who are undergoing capacity building training are really sought after, and they don't stay in their job very long because they now become very upwardly mobile, and so they move on. And so the huge challenge is that as you are doing capacity building within, and we've experienced this in the countries that we're working in, that as they get trained, they get better jobs and they move on. And so the institution where they were trained is still left without the capacity. And so you have this constant vacuum. There's also a lack of physical infrastructure and by that, I don't just mean there's a lack of laboratories. They're, they're often laboratories, but they are purposed for other reasons. Um, virus cassava detection, um, for example, in Malawi, but that are not really tailor-made to do GM detection. And so most of the laboratories that we work in are required to repurpose the laboratories to save some costs because there never is, in capacity building generally, there's never money to build new buildings. And it can also be quite challenging to repurpose a building in a developing country, I can tell you now. Um, to break down a wall and put up a new one is really not so simple as just saying it. And then there's a major challenge, and that is a lack of access to affordable equipment and consumables. So most of the equipment and consumables that we would use in Southern Africa are all imported. And currently the cost is at least, at least two to three times more than in developed countries. And there are a number of reasons for this. 
Um, but it doesn't stop there. In-country customs processes become a total nightmare because the processes can be tedious, time-consuming, and expensive. It's often a source of revenue for uh, that customs department. Many of the customs um, facilities lack cold chain facilities, and that can just simply result in reagents being spoiled. And then, in terms of sub technical support for equipment, um, often in countries, it's agents that are the middleman supplying the reagents or the equipment. So there's little or no technical support for equipment or maintenance and training. And then just the last, but unfortunately not the least, is that institutional procurement processes can also be very bureaucratic, which simply means that um, the procurement process is not managed by the scientists that need the equipment or the reagents, but managed by administrators. And often by the time that the equipment or the reagents are procured, uh, it may be the wrong equipment, it may be the wrong reagents. So in 2017 to 2023, we had a multi-country project this is the official title, multi-country project to strengthen institutional capacities on LMO testing in support of national decision making. This is a UNEP jeff funded project coordinated by Brain Africa and I was a technical consultant in that project. It's just a kind of nice way of saying they did all the administration and I did the rest of the work, which is a very good relationship. And the countries that were taking part in this particular project were Angola, De Democratic Republic of Congo, Lesotho, Madagascar, Malawi, and Mozambique. What we decided from the onset is to take a different approach to capacity building. Instead of us determining the needs as we thought they should be, we actually sat down with the partner countries and we discussed over a very broad range, the needs that existed. And we followed this reiterative process of really engaging with the partners to decide what needs to be done. Then deciding how we are going to do it, we defined the capacity development strategies and measures on how to measure the, the, uh, the outcome. We would Im implement and then measure those activities, we would monitor and learn from the process, and then we would start the next cycle. So although we had a project plan, we had within the project plan this reiterative cycle of constantly going through the process and coming back to the end and saying, okay, what did we learn? What do we need to change? What do we need to um, include? And that worked really, really well. It's more time consuming, but it means more for the capacity building in country. So the objectives were simply very similar to other typical capacity building initiatives. Um, we were looking to strengthen sampling for LMO detection, qualitative LMO detection, quantitative detection of LMOs, and then also laboratory quality management. But in addition to that, what we also specifically spent a lot of energy on is looking at things like spatial orientation and process flow, procurement processes, communication and report writing, costing of the diagnostic services and financial stability. And these more soft skills um, were really the value adding to enable the um, laboratories to take what, was, what they were being trained in um, to the next level. So we, we really tried to develop a process where we'd have a multiply effect. We'd have you know, the workshop to train the trainers. Then that would be followed 
by an in-country training of additional staff by the trained trainers. And because we had more than one laboratory in-country, that they would then work together to actually perform that training. Um, we would then have a component to have a practical implementation of the training. It might be samples that we then did into laboratory testing. Um, we would then have interactive online sessions to get feedback and discuss the, the practical challenges that were being experienced. And then we would engage um, to then discuss the next phase, what the challenges were, what we needed to do, and we would then have the next cycle. And we did this, we have been doing this throughout the cycle of the training. So this is my last slide in conclusion. I really think that capacity building is much more effective within the context of a supportive network. A lot of the problems that are experienced are not unique, but sharing the lessons is actually very, very important and it helps. And I think the capacity building needs to take the practical in-country considerations into account. Something that we know is that having capacity building training in a, in, in a country, in a laboratory with all the facilities is wonderful. And then the participants go back to their own countries and there's nothing. So we, we changed that. In, in university terms, we say we flipped the classroom. So we flipped the classroom. We took the training to them. And we did the training in those environments where they would have to work so that they could actually um, continue with the process. And along the way, there were some major challenges, but we, we learned from those lessons. So we really followed or tried to follow a reiterative approach to the training, which on the one hand ensures the continual buy-in and implementation, but on the other hand, it constantly is strengthening the capacity so that you're not just training somebody and then they move on. You're training more than a person. So it really is about the multiply effect to reinforce the training through in-country training and the additional practical components. And that means that a hit and run workshop is really not the, the ideal situation. I'm not saying that hit and run, sorry for the term, hit and run workshops, is you hold the workshop and you leave. And that's okay. But I think at some point, if you want the capacity building to actually have an impact, you need to actually strengthen the capacities of what happens after the workshop. And I think that is my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention.